here to talk about political education. Obviously, the whole of the world transformed is for that purpose. Um, but this is thinking about specifically why political, political education is so important. And to kind of introduce um, the strand of political education, we have Charlie Clark, who um, organised the world transformed last year, is one of the unsung heroes of TWT, and like our many volunteers, is incredibly humble in the background, working so hard to make things happen. And he's going to tell us all about um, what's going to be coming up in the next four days. So a massive round of applause for Charlie, please. All right. Can you hear me all right? All right. Thanks, Holly. I'm nowhere near as enthusiastic as Holly, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> um, and, and as she says, we don't, we don't normally platform ourselves, so this is, you know, and also we've been up for, you know, since two in the morning getting this place ready. So anyway, right. Um, so yeah, I'm one of the organizers. I've been doing it since um, we started. And, it's, and for myself, it's been a massive, you know, um, lesson in political education, just being involved and meeting so many amazing people from different ages, different walks of life, you know, and working with, you know, amazing people. Um, I'm not going to talk for too long for all the reasons I just said, and also we've got some amazing speakers, and I don't want to take up too much time. Um, but just quickly, just to give a bit of context, um, so for me, political education is, you know, about getting to understand how my own experience is, is related to a broader context, you know, to, to the state, to capitalism, to the media, you know, and how it's influenced by all of these things. And, you know, through understanding that context, how we can then think about changing it. Um, so it's not just about thinking, it's about acting, right? And for us at The World Transform, that process of development and understanding and change can happen in, in lots of many ways. And so I think our focal principle is pluralism, really. It's that, you know, that development can happen through workshops, through art exhibitions, through football matches, through, you know, the, you know lots of different things, formal talks but also that it happens in the queues, you know, over a coffee, on the dance floor, on the Saturday night, in the Tuesday night, you know, everywhere. And, we, and when, we, when we plan the festival, we think about that and, and we think about how, you know, different spaces can, you know, facilitate, you know, you know really interesting discussions. So why do we need to make the case for political education? It seems pretty obvious that we, we should be doing it and we're all here, but I think, you know, like, as Holly says, We've had an amazing three years. We've had a series of campaigns. We've, we've been incredibly focused on elections, and, and those things are incredibly important for getting a Labour government and for building the society we want. At the same time, you know, we can, we can get lost in them a little bit, and our perspective can narrow. And you know, it's really important, I think, that if we're genuinely serious about building that new society, that we, we, we keep open that space where we can interrogate ourselves and each other and our ideas and, and yeah, yeah. Um, so, this year, like, the World Transform is moving from, becoming, from being just a festival to hopefully being an organisation all year round that facilitates and supports other people and other groups to build political education on the left. And so we'll be organising, you know, trainings, working with activists and different organisations to build initiatives in local areas and we'll be developing our online presence and, and creating lots more resources to share with the movement and you know hopefully you know build toward a, a really you know dynamic culture of political education that we all can you know um, input into and develop um, so in preparation for that we thought this year we would have a strand of sessions that are about questioning what we mean by political education um, what what obstacles we face in trying to do it and scale it up, um, work out what's already going on. There is lots of really amazing stuff already going on. We need more of it. Um, and also just get lots of people involved. You know, like, it, this is not about us seeing ourselves as educators. It's about us supporting everyone else to, to you know, be better prepared for, for developing political education. So we've got this strand of sessions. This is the first one. This is... This is, for me, the, the, the session that's all about asking the kind of big question about what we mean by political education, what different forms it takes, and, you know, hopefully having a really kind of interesting discussion about what that means. Directly after this at one o'clock, we've got one about um, political education in the Labour Party, the role of the political education officer. Tomorrow, we've got a session called History Lessons, all about the history of political education in this country and abroad. 
And then on Sunday, which would be great if as many of you could come to, we've got a popular education forum where we're going to get together in a very participatory way and kind of work out what's already going on, map political education, and, and yeah, work through certain issues and start to form a network. So I'll leave it at that. There's sign-up seats on the table, but there's not many pens, so I'm going to try and sort that. But yeah, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, just let's just get, get the conversation going about how we can get more and better political education in our movement. Thank you very much. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much um, to Charlie for kind of introducing the session. Um, so, uh, my next speaker needs um, almost no introduction, a man who has spent his entire life fighting for socialism, and for me, whose kind of fiery optimism is, is what has kept hope alive when we've had some really difficult times in the last three years. Uh, an extraordinary man, and my absolute pleasure to introduce John McDonnell. <laughs> Thanks, Ollie. Oh. It was said that um, the question was put that who got up early, and a lot of hands went up. Who told you you could sleep? <laughs> this is a, a slackening in the revolutionary potential of our movement that you're going to bed these days. A couple of years ago, when the well, Transform took off in terms of the leadership elections. It, I thought it was, it was genuinely transformative, genuinely transformative in the way we had a discussion and debate about the politics running alongside the um, Labour Party conference. And for years, you know what, it, well, some of you will know what it was like. There was a dead, stultifying hand on Labour Party conference where there was no, we were not allowed at any time to frighteningly to talk about politics, and certainly individual delegates from constituencies getting to the rostrum was like trench warfare to fight their way onto the platform itself. When Jeremy got elected, it started the debate off, and we toured around the world. Jeremy toured, you know the joke. Jeremy said, come on, and the leadership election, let's go around the country together. And I said, no, it will look like last a summer wine going on tour at stages. <laughs> And he went, around, he went around the country, and what was amazing, I did that, you know, I did that traditional thing about, you know, book small halls, 50 chairs, and if no one turns up, take a few away, that sort of stuff. And as soon as he started touring round, you know, we booked the first hall for 100 people, 500 turned up, the next for 500, 1,000 turned up, and it just demonstrated at that point in time when everyone thought that no one was interested in talking about politics and our politics and socialism and transformative change, there was a hunger for that debate. There was an absolute hunger. But structurally within the Labour Party, for literally maybe two decades, there had been no opportunity or no encouragement to that to happen, and certainly the structures were not there, either to develop the debate, and certainly political education had died overall. And we took from that the need for some form of which we could bring people together, but not in that old traditional stultifying way. Though I've been in most left organizations throughout my life. There aren't many that I haven't been expelled from. You know, the, the, in, in the old days, we'd, we'd come together, meet, set up the committee, expel the first person, then have the traditional split, and it would go all in that tradition. And we thought, we just can't go through that same old cycle again. And then a large number of particularly young people turned up and said, look, we're going to do this world transform. The tra and it was just unbelievable. And the first one was just, it was just so exciting. It was for the first time people could get up on a platform and express their views in a way where it didn't matter whether it was wrong or right or whether you agreed or disagreed, you had the opportunity to express your views. And of course I did, and that got me in front page of the Daily Mail, the Sun, the Telegraph, the Times, and all the rest of it. It didn't matter. It didn't matter because we'd cut through all that crap. We started talking to each other. The media weren't going to set our agenda anymore. We were going to set it ourselves. And that's what World Transform did in that first, that first debate and discussion. Each year now, it's got bigger and better and more creative, and extremely more creative. I'm glad it's not a perennial now that we have a leadership election. Maybe let's not have one for maybe two decades and leave Jeremy there for a bit. But the, 
the issue now is how do we consolidate that enthusiasm and that inspirational way in which we approach the political date, debate through the world transformed in the sessions that we've now had associated with a party conference. Because it's great that people are coming to meetings now around the country and it's great that the world transformed takes place at each Labour Party conference. But in the discussions that we've had over the last few months, what we want to do is make that permanent now. And so therefore, I'm looking forward to the World Transform becoming a permanent organization, working throughout the year, building up that debate in the, with the enthusiasm that we display each year at Labour Party conference in, in, in these events. And it's desperately needed. If you look at when the Labour Party was first founded, when it was first came together, there were a whole range of institutional structures to encourage political debate and to encourage political education. And they worked. They worked. They worked in terms of the Labour Party and a whole range of other organisations. When I was a kid, I was appointed as a, a research officer at the National Union of Mine Workers, and I was appointed by a guy called Lawrence Daly, a Scottish miner, and Mick McGuire. Now, they were possibly the most well-read people I'd ever met in my life. Lawrence Daly would be able to quote D.H. Lawrence, Burns, Shakespeare at the drop of a hat, and also would have a clear analytical view about the role of capitalism, and would be able to quote a whole range of socialists. There was a, with, same with Mick McGahey. They were autodidacts, but they were autodidacts using the institutions of the labor movement, either their trade union, the Workers' Education Association, the various think tanks that then existed as well. A lot of that was wiped out in the 80s, well, from the 90s onwards, really. And those structures almost wiped out completely. And that's why there's a vacuum in terms of political education now. Yes, we've got in specialist areas like Socialist Health Association, Socialist Education Association, etc. But even they have struggled in terms of membership and support and need reviving now. So what I think the role of the world transform now is to fill that vacuum, to fill that vacuum where, of the institutional structure where people can relate to an organization that will provide them with the facility First of all, to meet others. Second, to learn more. And a lot of that is about learning our history and about the, our ideology and the ideas that have been developed overall. But then also to debate more and develop those ideas on. And why is that critical? Um, Panitch and Gombin have done their book recently, Socialist Challenge. And it looks at the, ex it examines the role of Syriza, examines the Bernie Sanders campaign, examines uh, Jeremy Corbyn's campaign as well. And there's lessons from that. And the lessons are these. First of all, in terms of going into government, the lesson of how to use the state. And that's what we're doing at the moment, that training exercise of preparing for government. But the second exercise is that when you go into government, you've got to ensure that the, the rank and file base is not somehow cut off from those that go into representative positions in government or local government or regional government or whatever. And the way that you ensure it's not cut up, cut off is that you have, yes, direct political and direct political and democratic accountability, but you're nourishing the debate and from the base, you're nourishing the representative leadership all the time by that debate of ideas and the development of ideas. And I think that's what we've, the lesson that we've got to learn now, that we've got half a million members in the Labour Party. The trade union movement has begun to grow again with the influx of young people especially. We've got all these different campaigns ranging from anti-fracking to all the campaigns around equalities, etc. And it is absolutely buzzing now. But what we've got to do is that we build upon that to ensure that we display the development of ideas. That will take us into government. I have no doubt about that. I think the popularity of our policies, the demand for real change, the ending of austerity, will popularly pre present us with the opportunity of going into government. But when we go into government, we can't just go into a government saying, this is our manifesto, we're going to implement this, and that's all there is. The manifesto itself is going to be fine, it'll be more radical than the last one, I'm convinced of that. And it will be a working document, but it will be a working document because what we've got to do is make sure that when we go into government, we have the whole of the movement engaged in the implementation of those policies at every level. And I say time and time again, when we go into government, it cannot just be electing a number of MPs who then go into ministerial office and we wave goodbye to them. When we go into government next time around, we've all got to go into government. We've all got to be involved in the development and implementation of those policies, and yes, radicalize them whilst we're in government. And at the same time, 
Yes, it is about hegemonizing the debate. Uh, I always quote Gramsci in it just to encourage the Daily Mail in their reportage. But um, <laughs> the, the whole concept of hegemonizing the debate is that we make all our policies as they are, understandable in common sense terms. People realize they're pragmatic and they're a pragmatic form of common sense socialism. And we do it in such a way it encourages even more support for those policies. And it will then not just get us elected, but will sustain us in government. Because when we go into government, there will be challenges. The establishment aren't going to roll over and just let a Labour government do everything it wants. There'll be opposition. So what we've got to do is mobilise people to make sure that opposition is overcome and make sure that we continue in that popular dialogue to maintain, pardon the expression, the momentum of the work that we're doing. I think that's why the World Transform can play such a critical role. It is about bringing people together. It's about making sure that we have the facilities to understand the issues that we're confronting, that we learn from history, and that we use it as an exercise to train us in genuine transformers of the world. And if we can start that off over this coming few days in terms of the debate, and people will have, you will all have your creative ideas about how we do that, if we can start that off, I think it will be possibly one of the most important things that we'll do at this conference. I think it'll be most probably one of the most important breakthroughs that we'll make that in the long run, not just succeed, ensure our success to get into government, but to stay, sustain us in government and to sustain, as I say, our ideas about how we transform the world. I just want to make one final pitch, really. The work that we'll, we'll do is important. You know, at the moment, I'm touring around the country. Every fortnight, we're holding economic seminars in individual constituencies, and we're going along, we're saying to people, look, this is what the statistics tell us about your community. You tell us. And from that, then, we're trying to get people coming together with our community organizers to develop their own economic prospectus for their area, an economic plan. And we'll be doing that, not just on the economy, but on housing and health and all those things as well. And I think that's beginning to, I think, beginning to bear fruit. And we're having something like 150, 200 people turn up in each constituency on a Saturday for most of the day involved in the discussion and the detail. And people are buzzing with ideas. But what's clearly coming across as well, people are incredibly creative, they're knowledgeable, but they're not knowledgeable about our own history as a movement. And it's quite remarkable, as a result of the dearth of political education from the party in particular over, the, over recent years, just how far back we've gone is just a basic understanding of the struggles that we've had in recent periods. I went to the plaza last night and Phil Maxwell and Hushen uh, launched their new film. And it was about the Merseyside Pensioners Association. Um, again, if you haven't heard of them, watch the film, because it is absolutely inspirational. In fact, I said to them last night, you must have been behind the storming of the Winter Palace, because you were everywhere. And if you look at all the different struggles that have gone on in recent years, here's a group of people who over the years have engaged themselves in all of those struggles. But I listened to them. I listened to what they were saying. I thought, my God, the understanding and anal analysis that they had, the language that they were using, was like stepping back 20 or 30 years. And it is because there's been that break and gap in the political education movement that we've had in, in recent years. And it's now this new generation that's coming forward to recreate the institutions and the dynamism of political education that we now need. And I think, my God, if, if, if we could just have the, the motivation, the understanding of the world that the Merseyside Pensions Association, we most probably would be in a revolutionary moment. It was remarkable. And what came out of it is that traditional thing, really, and someone said it in the discussion afterwards. It was praxis, theory and practice put together to transform the world. And I think that's what, what will come out of the debate and the discussions we'll have the next couple of days. Don't underestimate how important this is. We could be making a breakthrough over the next couple of days that could transform our movement for the next decade and the next generation. Solidarity.
Okay, so um, thank you so much to John uh, and to Charlie for that fantastic introduction. And we've got a fantastic panel, and we're going to start with um, Gary Anderson, who is the recently elected political education officer for his CLP. He co-founded um, Artists for Corbyn, is co-founder of the Liverpool Free University, and he says he makes his money trying to radicalise students at Liverpool Hope University, um, which I can, I can kind of have some sympathy for. It's amazing how much anti-capitalism you can get into a year nine English lesson these days. So um, let's welcome Gary to the stage, please. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks a million. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks to the organisers for having me. I just noticed, like, I was slightly crestfallen when John walked in because I was better dressed than he was. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, hey, this is bad. He put his jeans on and everything. I thought, oh, well done, John Goodman. OK, so it's a total privilege to share this uh, platform with Lindsay, with Dahlia, uh, with Holly, and uh, Charlie, too. So thanks a million. And obviously with the uh, soon-to-be Chancellor of the Exchequer and <laughs> occupier of number 11, Downing Street. Go, John. So, like everyone else, when asked to say a few words at an event like this, apart from shitting yourself, you work hard and you try to make the most of it and say the most important thing you can think of. So, like everyone else, you get stuck somewhere in between wanting to say everything you've ever thought of and trying to whittle it down to a few little digestible points. That's a special kind of hell, I think. And you don't want to mess it up because people have trusted you, and the platform, this particular platform, as John was talking about, is potentially so important and so extensive. So you also don't want to just repeat platitudes that probably every single person in the room knows better than the speaker. So I'm in a bit of a fix. It's especially relevant, I think, in building a popular political education movement, because what people say on the platforms like these matters. So, as an artist, activist, educator, I wanted to say something about the form of speaking from platforms like these and how, in many ways, a popular political education movement can't start from platforms like these. It has to start and be maintained from floors like these. So speaking from platforms has its place, it's true, and sometimes it's a necessary moment every now and again. It's a chance to cheer together or feel like we're part of a movement, we've just scored a great goal, pick that out. Obviously we need those sorts of moments, but on the whole, speaking from a platform is largely illusion. It's subterfuge, it's misleading. Uh, what happens here on stage is literally nothing to what happens in the hearts and heads of what happens in your everyday lives. So, that leads me on to, fear, to, to, to ask the question, what, if we're gonna build a popular political movement, what does it feel like? What does political education feel like? I've had, I've been lucky enough to have in, in my uh, experience, uh, some totally orgasmic moments, some life-changing uh, epiphanies in some of the stuff I've done, in the past in political education, like the Free University of Liverpool, uh, or Artists for Corbyn, or the tiny art activist cell that I run with my partner, uh, Lena Shimic, who's the newly elected chair of the most radical CLP in the country, Liverpool Walton CLP. Up there, Lena. So we, together with our four boys, we run this tiny art activist cell uh, called the Institute for the Art and Practice of Dissent at Home. So I've had some epiphanies working with those sorts of organisations and it's been, it's been amazing. But I've never really had an epiphany when someone was pontificating on a platform like I'm doing right now. So it leads me to the question, what, does, what, what would a good political education programme feel like? So apart from all the wonderful and clever and radical things that people uh, will say over the course of the world transform, and I'm really looking forward to it all, I, I always ask myself the question as an artist, what does it all feel like? What does it feel like to address a room of however many uh, hundreds are here? Uh, what does it feel like there next to the person uh, you're sitting with? What does it feel like to have to, for the next five or six minutes, listen to me? What's it feel like knowing you weren't invited or selected to be on this prestigious panel? 
What does it feel like listening to me through speakers, having to buy tickets, feeling you're in momentum, and almost certainly, probably, having a rancid right-wing mainstream media person in amongst you, waiting for a moment where they can eavesdrop on a potentially headline-grabbing sentence as anti-Semitic. What's that feel like? <laughs> in other words, as an artist, I'm asking in a more formal way, what are the aesthetics of political education? And does that matter? Does it matter what things feel like? In other words, given the general left tendency of our thinking about social and ecological justice, and there's an enormous amount of variation uh, and nuance there, lots of fascinating detail and discussions to be had, uh, and I'm sure virtually everybody in the world transformed will have a view on this topic or that topic, and that's crucial. But I wanted to remind us that we are, if we are uh, more than just uh, a political party, and if we are, in fact, a social movement, then it is just as important to consider how we organize our debates and discussions. Not only what we say that matters, but the conditions under which we can say those things matters. In other words, how it feels to us and everyone. So it's an age-old question. It's not, not a new question, but it's a relevant question still. What's the form of something? What's the content of something? Platform, who are my heroes, uh, they're a London-based group of researchers, educators, activists, campaigners, thinkers, uh, been around uh, since the beginning for about 30 years now, uh, are still producing uh, what I think is about the most important work in political education. They have on their office wall, uh, at least the last time I went there it was on the office wall, a hand-sewn equation framed behind a little uh, glass front. The equation, uh, hand-stitched by Mel Evans of Liberate Tate and now Greenpeace, but formerly of Platform, is this. Form plus content equals communication. In other words, how everything makes you feel is just as important as what people actually say. Now, I was talking to Charlie the other, the, the other day about speaking on this platform, and he said, could you throw a bit of theory in as well? So I said, okay, so here's the theory bit now. <laughs> Paolo Freire, hey, let's have a round of applause for Paolo Freire. <laughs> Paolo Freire. So Paulo Freire, the Brazilian uh, government minister exiled for his political views, talks about radical pedagogy, or he called it critical pedagogy, uh, the functions of which is to produce a critical consciousness, moving away from what he called the banking method of learning, uh, which is pouring facts into empty heads and then testing those now full heads at a later date and giving them a grade. That's the banking method. It doesn't work. We know that. He says that everything is constructed, including the way we learn. To learn how everything is constructed is to then learn two things. Number one, it's not natural or God-given. And number two, that we can change anything, including the world. Yes, we can change the world. That's what he says. In other words, the form you choose to teach or learn in is just as important as the content of what you learn. Now, this applies to classrooms, lectures, all teaching spaces. As Holly just pointed out, obviously it applies to this space too, in our uh, cabaret-style tables where we can all have little natters to each other and everything. Uh, in other words, there, there's a revolutionary potential in absolutely every space we're in. That's what Paolo Freire says. The trick is to produce collectively a critical consciousness. Now, Freire was obviously deeply influential to a whole school of... Uh, 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 radical educators. Uh, my favourites are Audre Lorde, uh, the, the, the black lesbian uh, uh, political activist uh, based, in, based in the US, and her, uh, my favourite quote from her is this, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow you to temporarily beat the master at his own game, but they won't allow you to bring about genuine social change. It's a, it's a take on Freirean critical pedagogy. 
And Bell Hooks, uh, an, uh, another black American radical educationalist, uh, wrote a book, Teaching to Transgress, that I'm sure most people in the room uh, are familiar with. If you, if you haven't read it, read it. It's, it's beautiful and perfect. And she, she says that at the heart of any revolutionary moment, uh, there needs to be a recognition of the lived experience of each individual, and that's where the revolution gets its fuel from. It gets its power from there. Again, that's a, that's a Paolo Freirean take on, on what political education can be. So, uh, artists for Corbyn are trying, uh, in teaming up with, two, two minutes, thanks, uh, at, uh, teamed up with Platform, uh, the, the, the group that I mentioned before, and we're, we're trying as part of the world uh, transformed to undertake a daring boat trip uh, to the UK's largest uh, offshore wind farm, which is called Burbo Bank, which is not far from Liverpool. It's about four miles in Liverpool Bay. Uh, we do this to educate ourselves and each other about energy production and ownership and taking the power of the wind away from profit-making companies into public ownership. And as part of the, uh, the Labour Energy Forum last year uh, at the World Transformed reminded us, uh, whoever owns the wind owns the future. So we need, need, need political education on this, I think. Now, I'm going to ask, uh, as, a, as a way of demonstrating uh, the form and the content and the uh, critique of the platforming, uh, artists for Corbyn, who are seated at the back, who are seated at the back uh, over here, to reveal the world premiere, unfurl the world premiere of our new political education banner. <laughs> we're going to take a boat trip out to Bebo Bank, and we're going to unfurl that banner there. And the banner reads, "The people will possess." the wind. The people will possess the wind. So the artists for Corbyn and Platform and a few other people, we're all going out there on the boat and we're going to come back and talk to people in a workshop on Tuesday at one o'clock at the Hinterlands. Uh, uh, we'll talk about our boat trip and we'll talk about putting in place or kick-starting just how the people uh, will possess the wind and how we can bring the power of the wind and re renewable energy into public ownership. So how might that feel? Solidarity, everyone. Thank you so much for a brilliant talk. And um, surely we can get, at some point, that kind of drop down to go, go with our amazing banners on here, or is it going straight to be dropped somewhere? Ah, okay, so it's a one day only, that's an exclusive, yeah, okay, great, um, and thank you so much. The... Yes, I'm sure somebody from our wonderful TWT volunteers can now do a second round of that banner drop, but um, art's so important to, um, to our movement, and you'll see these beautiful banners that are all around the space here um, that have been kind of lovingly handcrafted, and please do check out all of the art stuff that's happening because there's so much um, cool stuff happening. So, our next speaker is um, Lindsay McDowell, who is Head of Education for the Fire Brigades Union, uh, previously from my union, the, the NUT, and she says that she is London-based, but working nationally and thinking globally. Globally. So can we have a massive round of applause, please, for Lindsay? She said she'd make it smaller, but she didn't. Are we okay? Oh, sorry. It's all right, honey. I'm joking. It's all right. Can you hear me? Are we okay? Right. Yeah, Good. I didn't want to ask you what union you were in. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit competitive in teaching around trade unions, so I wasn't going to ask. And similarly, actually, I'm not going to ask anyone else if you're involved with your trade unions here, but um, hopefully even around what I say, if you're not involved with your trade union, if you're not a member, then maybe you're in a position where you could join a trade union if you are in a trade union, but you haven't had any contact with the education side of things, then maybe, you know, maybe you'll think as a result of this uh, whole weekend uh, that you'll get involved because there's a lot going on. Okay, uh, so, uh, yeah, as Holly said, I'm uh, the head of education for the Fire Brigade Union. I come from the National Union of Teachers. I equally am very pleased to be here. And um, I, uh, I feel a bit grateful to Gary, actually, because he's just taken all the pressure off me. I'm not a person who stands at the front and tells people what to think or what to do. So you just said, what happens up here 
is not as important as what happens down there. So that makes me really, really happy right now. Um, and plus, the round tables are really helpful. If you'd been sitting in rows of chairs, I think I just would have run away. So um, uh, just one other thing I wanted to say before I get going. Um, I will talk about my experience and my views. These are not my own views. They're not new views. There's a whole community of people in the trade union movement who are doing really exciting things around education. There's a real kind of debate going on about what trade union education is about. I'm just going to give you a flavour of that now. Um, but it, this is not just me. There's tons of people doing good stuff. So um, all power to them as well, I'm afraid. Okay, so why is political education a trade union issue? Well, for a lot of us, we spend more time doing work than we spend doing almost anything else, sleeping, having our own time, family time. There's an awful lot of work, particularly if you factor in all the travel time, the break times, all of that sort of thing. Work is incredibly social, which makes it a great place to think about political education, to try out what you've learned, uh, to test things out, to see if you've got it right, do people agree with you, disagree with you, is it going to make any difference? So work is a great space, and obviously trade unions are all about what happens at work in the main. Uh, there's obviously also all the issues around the power of workers, uh, how we bring about change in society. Luckily, that's not my brief right now, but I know there are other, se uh, other sessions that are going to think about those sorts of things. So from here, you'll have opportunity to talk about all of those other things. Uh, trade unions have a proud history of being involved in, um, in political education. We call it popular education, critical pedagogy more recently, um, both in terms of direct provision of education, political education, but also ensuring that working people get access to education, something that is you know, on the wane. Um, also, I must say that what I have to say, uh, it starts with recognition of the terrible financial austerity attacks that have happened on further education. Most trade union education is linked to further education colleges. Funding's been cut, colleges have been closed or amalgamated, and seriously respect to everyone who's still working in that sector and doing such great things, because it's important. Um, so in terms of trade unions, we have statutory agreements around learning, we have, um, we have statutory entitlements, we have reps that can help people access learning, members um, find out what's happening, what people are interested in, um, and also fund it in some cases, which is exciting. We run education, which is um, small group, big group. We run um, one-day-a-week courses, uh, small short courses, year-long courses, years and years and years-long courses. Um, we run union courses with one union's members, lots of union's members. There's tons and tons of ways to get involved. And I guess what I'm saying, trade union education is really good. Um, so that's one of my key messages. Is that all right? <laughs> OK. Um, so what do we do? So there's a real functional kind of transactional side to what trade union education is. Um, so you get involved with your union, you say, yeah, I'll be a rep. Um, lots of unions call them different things, I just call it rep, just to be brief. Um, uh, so you say, yeah, I'm going to get involved, and we say, great. You say you're going to do that, so we say we'll give you education to help you do it. Um, so. Uh, you might think, well, okay, so, oh, just to be clear, I don't train people to be firefighters, just in case you were worried about that. That's not me. <laughs> uh, so your, your safety is not any, in any way at risk. Um, but we do, we talk about, you know, working with members, about representation, about uh, negotiation, consultation with the employer, all the kind of standard stuff that you'd expect. Um, and that's all great. That's all really good, and to be honest, we could leave it there, we'd still get paid, and the world would be fine, and, or not. Um, but that would be the end of the job. The problem is that when we get people in those spaces, they start asking bigger questions. They start asking why questions. Uh, so I was on a course not so long ago, and uh, the tutor, or at least someone who was in the room in a tutor capacity, said to brand new reps, first day of training, in fact, really early in the morning, actually, what you'll spend most of your time doing as a trade union rep is grievance and discipline. I was like, okay, why questions? Firstly, why would you say that? It's not true. <laughs> it's really not true. That's not what most reps do. But also, why would you think that that was the case? Well, why? What is it about work that is so antagonistic, which is what's going on at work that would create a situation where we have to mediate the process between employees and employer? What is really going on there? Um, so why would we, even if we acknowledge that that is the situation for a lot of people in their workplaces, 
why would we be looking at individual solutions? Just looking at one person, one member, and their, um, and you know, trying to deal with it member by, mem by member by member. We are a collective. We in work, we're a group. Oh, excuse me. And we need to deal with our situations and our problems exactly in that way. Oh my God! <laughs> I've not even started loving. Right. So the point about trade union education done well is that when these questions come up, we have to go and go and go and go. We have to keep going. Follow wherever that conversation leads. It leads to lunch it, we're on residential courses. It leads to the bar. It leads to all kinds of things. It leads to people going back to their workplace and having those conversations in work. Rep, being a rep is not static. I can't train people to deal with whatever it is that work's going to throw at them. You know, people are coming and they're getting um, shifts changed, they're getting food issues addressed, not addressed in work, we're getting, you know, service closures, privatisations, all kinds of huge things. I don't know what their work's going to throw at them. We need them to be aware, conscious, agile in their thinking. All of this isn't going to come from just going through an ACAS code of practice, as important as that is. Um, those big questions really do matter. Um, I'm going to say a quick word. I, I thought I wasn't going to, but I am. Um, one of the big debates in trade union education at the moment is about how we deliver our education. And online learning just ain't going to do it. I'm sorry. Um, online activism is a different thing. That's fine. But if you want people to feel the impact, all of those things that Gary just talked about, you're not going to get that by logging in, answering a few questions, looking at a few cartoon diagrams, and then thinking, OK, well, now I know how to be a world changer. That's not going to happen. So we do need to kind of, wherever you, if you hear that, don't believe them when they tell you that online learning is just as good as classroom learning. It's not true. Um, so for the big questions like me, we, the, the real question is that trade union education is all about getting people to stand up. Stand up at work, stand up for each other, stand up to, against the attacks that are going on, stand up for people in another country that you'll never meet because it's really important that we work together. Um, I recently uh, developed a, a kind of course of education, we call it a training programme, but terminology is a big issue. Um, and with lots of other excellent people, not just me by any means. Um, and it was fundamentally, it was based on the Wizard of Oz. Now, some of the people who were involved in developing it don't know that it was based on the, <laughs> on the Wizard of Oz, but it was. So what we did was we said, well, okay, what do we need in order to own what we're doing, get people to feel like they are powerful and therefore that they can change things? They need the knowledge, they need... Um, the basics, so that is your ACAS code of practice, it might well be, or it might be lots of other things, it might be about how the world works, so that's your scarecrow, that's your brain. You also need to have um, courage, and you also need to have a good instinct, and that's really your nerve, that's your lion, that's your nerve. But also, you have to have a heart, you have to believe that we can make a difference, you have to believe that change will come, and you have to believe that it's worth standing up for whatever it is that your issue is on that particular day. So there we had a cowardly lion, a, a scare, did I say skeleton? Sometimes it's a skeleton. Scarecrow and a tin man. And those were the three things that we tried to build into that education program. And everything kind of came from that because it really was about if you want to develop world changers, you have to talk about changing them. You have to think about how are we relating to the world around us. Now, all I do is create a space where that can happen. I'm not going to teach people to stand up to their boss. You can't do that. People have to find out for themselves. We're collaborative, we promote collaborative learning, and actually in that collaborative space, that's where those decisions are made, and that's where that confidence comes from. If you want democratic practice, democratic organisations, then you need democratic education. If you want collaborative movement, a collaborative, interactive, a movement based on solidarity, then you need collaborative education. If you want world changers, then you have to change their world. The worst, for me, Oh, geez, where do you start? One of the worst crimes of capitalism is that it smothers our collective imagination about how the world could be different. It's really hard to find a space, to find a time where we can sit about talking about how things could be different. I had this conversation with Charlie, and he says it happens in her, his workplace quite a lot. And I was like, wow, lucky you. It doesn't happen in my workplace quite a lot. Um, that collective imagination is what we do when we clear some of that muck away in, in uh, progressive education, we create a little space where people can have a little think, and then they can have a big think, and then they can have discussion, they can have ideas, they can make plans. And as educators, at that point, our job is to just get the hell out of the way 
and let incredible things happen. So that's my view of trade union education. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for making the case for trade union education. So important. In fact, um, I want to give a shout out to the front row here, which is the uh, National Education Union Young Teachers. Um, obviously, they're in the front row because they're teachers. Um, and they have been organising, or we have been organising, um, my uh, young teacher group in London, um, reading groups and um, ideas, workshops and things like that, to take ideas about teaching, but then to expand that and to expand it into a deeper kind of political critique. So they're really awesome. So give them a round of applause. Okay, so um, our, our final speaker um, up next, and I've got her bio on my phone, is um, Dahlia Gabrielle. Is it Gabrielle, is that right? Dahlia Gabrielle, who is a PhD student at LSE, a former member of the Roads Must Fall campaign, incredible campaign, um, and she's the editor of a recently published volume on decolonizing the university. Um, so please welcome Dahlia. Hi, I'm going to speak using this because I'm very clumsy and I don't want to drop this. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, hello everyone and um, thank you so much for coming. Can you hear me all right? Is it okay? Um, thank you so much for coming to um, the first panel of what will hopefully be an amazing conference and in itself um, a site of political education. Um, so I'm going to build off what some of the other speakers said to talk about um, specifically how um, these kind of infrastructures of political education um, and particularly when it comes to providing those um, infrastructures for um, young people and particularly young people from marginalized backgrounds, how we can make sure that we don't reproduce the sometimes literally exclusionary um, practices of the mainstream education system. And um, I come at this from like a decolonial framework, which is basically a fancy way of saying that like knowledge is power and that the people who produce knowledge have power. And that's why it's important that we come up with systems of counter knowledge. Um, so, and, and the volume that was mentioned, um, I think it's like if Pluto has a stall somewhere, it will be on sale. And, and the thing about that volume is that it was it's basically teachers and activists who have spent many years trying to implement like a decolonial, anti-racist um, way of teaching and sort of develop these particular kinds of courses um, and also like radical pedagogical, in a, like radi radically different kinds of pedagogy. Um, actually just talking about their experiences and kind of like a little bit of theory, but it's mainly just like case studies and practical examples and saying, you know, this is what it was like trying to set up the first black studies degree in the UK. This is what we face, this is the challenge we face, this is what we did well, this is what we do differently, etc. So it's kind of really practical, really like story based. So um, if you want to know more about like decolonizing stuff, that's a useful resource. But um, yeah, so um, thinking about education in a decolonial framework is basically about thinking um, who provides education, um, who is that education about, and who receives it. So who produces knowledge, and what kinds of knowledge these people produce. So when we look at like the higher education system, for example, um, in 2013 to 2016, we saw zero black people represented at the highest levels of um, academia. Um, so we see um, people of color, um, very underrepresented in, acad in academic positions, in also in the student body, um, but very overrepresented in, for example, you know, the kind of labor that keeps the university going. So like security guards and cleaning work and all of this. And obviously all these different kinds of labor are really important in, in the functioning of our education system. But what that kind of tells us is that people of color aren't considered to be really the providers or the receivers of knowledge. They clean up after everyone else who do, who, for whom that, that is their job. Um, so decolonizing kind of concerns what we think knowledge actually is. What do we count as something that everyone should be taught? So we take it for granted that, you know, the Tudors or Shakespeare or, you know, a particular version of World War II 
are like obvious things that everyone should know about, but the history of working class communities, the history of anti-colonial struggles in the global south, um, the history of migration in Britain, this isn't seen as something that is worth knowing about. Um, but, the kind, but we do produce these kinds of knowledge because formal education systems aren't the only sites where we produce knowledge. Um, you know, these kinds of histories are passed down in our communities. So I'm thinking, you know, my grandmother telling me stories about what it's like living under British occupation. Um, you know, these are kind of other ways that these knowledges circulate. Um, but this is really powerful, like what we consider to be things that we should all know about, because the lens that we, that through which people understand the world around them is integral to how they think of themselves politically. So, you know, how would, for example, the national conversation around unions be different if we were all taught a full radical history of the miners' strike? How would the national conversation around borders and immigration be different if colonialism and the struggles against colonialism were taught with depth and critical engagement in our schools from the ground up, not just at university? How would people perceive themselves differently in terms of their own political power and agency um, if they were not only informed of the history of how you know, change for the better in this country has historically happened outside of Westminster, um, but if people were actually taught the campaigning strategies and given the tools to affect these kinds of changes themselves. Expanding pol political education is about expanding what is politically possible, and that's why it's so important. But this doesn't just involve providing new and radical programs of political education. It also means thinking really seriously about the structural and physical factors that play a role in defining who has access to what kinds of education and also whose histories and knowledge, knowledges are you know, taught in educational institutions. Um, so taking my, my own example, um, throughout my teenage years, my parents both worked six full days a week. Um, so I was often a primary carer for my younger brother. So that meant that after school activities, things at the weekend, were things that I couldn't really participate in because I had caring responsibilities because my parents couldn't afford to pay someone to to, to do that kind of childcare. So that's an example of a kind of material reality that excludes vast swathes of people from a lot of the political infrastructures that we build um, that kind of rely on people being able to give up three hours on a Thursday night or rely on people being able to spare, you know, their Saturday afternoons. Um, you know, how can we come up with um, sort of, you know, new um, pedag pedagogical methods to engage 